Hey everyone, I'm Mike Sattel, the founder of Sattel Tutoring and the author of the SAT Packet Study Guides. In this lesson, we're going to learn and practice some of the most important strategies for the SAT math section. If you're not a strong math student, these strategies are going to save you a ton of points. But even if you're amazing at math, I know with certainty that these strategies will get you closer to that perfect 800. But before we begin, let's make sure that you're prepared for the lesson. If you've already purchased a copy of my SAT Math Packet Study Guide, then you already have this lesson. We're going to cover the first three packets of the 2022 edition. If you have an earlier edition of my study guide, that's okay. There's literally only one question that's different from the ones that you have. If you don't yet have a copy of my study guide, then you can still follow along. Just download the free workbook from my website, satelltutoring.com. It's a great way to test out my study guide. And if you like this lesson, please consider purchasing a full copy. It'll help you improve your scores, and it supports me so that I can make more of my materials available for free. You can also support me by following me on Instagram for daily practice questions, subscribing to my YouTube channel for video explanations of the official practice tests, and you can check out my subreddit to ask me questions as you use my study guides and prep for the SAT. And all of this and more can be found on my website, satelltutoring.com. Now let's get to the lesson. Normally, I start these lessons off with a more thorough introduction to the SAT section and topics that we'll be covering. But I'm not going to do that here. Let's start by trying to notice and understand our instincts. For the first question, take a quick look. What do you think? How does the question make you feel? Excited? Anxious? What's your gut reaction for how to solve this? What would be your first step? If you'd like, feel free to pause the video and follow that instinct. See how far you can get. For those of you who aren't too happy about this question, just wait for five seconds and I'll help you through it. Okay, so this is some pretty standard advanced algebra. It's the kind of equation that we might see in Algebra 2 or pre-calculus. If you're starting your SAT prep early, you might not have gotten to this yet in school, but you will. I'm not going to teach and explain every single algebra step here, so just follow along as best you can, and if a step confuses you, that's okay. For now, just trust me, the confusion is kind of the point. And for those of you who have seen stuff like this before, you probably just dove right in and started solving the equation. Great. First, add 7 to both sides to move it away from the radical. Then, square both sides to get rid of the radical. But on the right side, we need to be really careful that we don't mess this up. First of all, we should put some parentheses here to make it clear that we're not just squaring the 2. We're squaring the entire term, x minus 2. Even if we do that, though, there's still a chance that we make a mistake. We can't just distribute this square to both parts and get x squared minus 4. We need to remember that x minus 2 squared means x minus 2 times x minus 2. We have to foil this out to get a more complicated quadratic. x squared minus 4x plus 4. This is a much better looking equation than the one we started with, but there are still some pretty difficult steps ahead. Our normal instinct with algebra, the way we're taught, is to isolate x, move everything away from x so that x is alone. But when we have an x squared, this instinct is wrong. In fact, we kind of need to do the opposite and bring all of the stuff toward the x. We want this equation equal to 0 so that we can factor. Remember that we need numbers that multiply to negative 6 and add to negative 1. That's positive 2 and negative 3. So the values of x that would make each of these factors equal to 0 are negative 2 and positive 3. And that matches with answer choice C. Whew, that was a lot of math for one question. Look at all this algebra that we had to do. That's a lot of steps. That's a lot of time and effort for just 10 points on the SAT. And here's the crazy thing. We didn't even earn the 10 points. This is not the right answer. Choice C is wrong. Now, I want to be very clear, all of this algebra is correct. There were a lot of steps, and many of them were very difficult, and we could have very easily made a mistake somewhere along the way that we might not have noticed. But that's not what happened. If your math teacher did this exact question on the board in school, he or she would get the exact same answers that we did, x equals negative 2 and x equals 3. But we forgot something. 
we forgot to check for extraneous solutions. Basically, when algebra gets complicated, there are times when we do the algebra correctly, but it spits out an answer that isn't quite right. This happens a lot with radicals and roots, so our job is to take the answers that the algebra produces and substitute them back into the original equation to test whether they're actually answers or just extra numbers that, through bad luck, we happen to get from our algebra. I know that this is already a very cluttered question, but just pay attention to the highlighted area while we check negative 2, which just happens to be choice A. First, we would substitute into the original equation. Then it's just about simplifying. I know that before we had to add 7 to both sides of the equation, but we don't have to do that anymore. That was an algebra move. But do you see any more letters here? This is just arithmetic now. Don't do algebra stuff unless you have an algebra equation. Multiply negative 3 and negative 2 to get positive 6. On the right side, negative 2 minus 9 is negative 11. Then we can do 10 plus 6 to get 16. The square root of 16 is 4. And does 4 minus 7 equal negative 11? No, negative 3 and negative 11 are different numbers. This right here is proof that negative 2 is not a valid solution to this equation. Negative 2 was extraneous. That means that we can cross off every answer choice that contains negative 2. And look, there's only one left. We don't even need to test positive 3. Choice B has to be correct. So this last step was easy. But most people forget to do it because usually when we get x equals something in math, that's the signal that the question is over, that math has been accomplished. The SAT knows this. They know that you're going to forget to check for extraneous solutions. And that's why choice C is an answer. It's a deliberate trap. <sighs> Look at the clock right now on this video. How long have we spent on this one question? It's insane. And I promise that the rest of this lesson will be a much faster pace, but I really wanted to make a very important point here right in the beginning. Algebra sucks. This is a huge pain. On the SAT, we need to avoid algebra. Avoid this as much as we can. And the solution was right on the top of this page all along. Guess and check. It's not a new strategy. You learned how to guess and check when you were young, but I bet you don't use it in school very often. Your teacher wants you to solve questions algebraically to show your work. But now for the SAT, guess and check is back and it's better than ever. Let's wipe this question clean for a second. How would guess and check work here? Well, the entire reason that we use algebra is that most math questions that we see in school are not multiple choice. If we didn't have answer choices, we would have to solve algebraically because x can literally be any number in the universe. Algebra gives us a system to narrow that infinite list down and ultimately to get some answers. But this isn't a math test. This is an SAT. It plays by different rules. x cannot be any number in the universe. We have a limited list of answers to start with. x can only be some combination of negative 2, positive 3, and negative 9. So instead of solving for x, which we just saw is long and complicated, we can instead test the values of x that we're given. We guess a number from the choices, and then we check to see if it works. And we kind of did that anyway as part of our algebra solution. But this time we've skipped all of the other hard work that came before it. And we don't even notice that choice C is a trap, because once negative 2 fails, we just cross out every choice that includes it. Choice B is, very quickly, the only possible answer. <sighs> now, <laughs> I know we're still talking about this one question, but bear with me for one more minute, and then I promise we'll move on. I just really want to make sure that I've thoroughly and clearly made my point, because the vast majority of my SAT math tutoring sessions are spent trying to convince my students of this very important idea. For this question, when you do a side-by-side -side comparison, there is no doubt that guess and check is superior to algebra. No doubt. Just look at the amount of work that we did. Not only did guess and check involve less work, but the work itself was also easier because we were able to do arithmetic instead of algebra. Fewer steps means fewer chances of making a careless mistake. Plus, algebra mistakes are harder to notice because our brains aren't really wired for algebra. 
There's a reason that we learn arithmetic when we're four and algebra when we're 14. And look, the SAT is a very long test. You're going to be tired by the time that you get to the math sections. So careless mistakes will almost certainly happen even if we're guessing and checking. But I think that losing a negative is easier to notice and correct when we're working exclusively with numbers, as opposed to algebra, where we have to keep track of both the numbers and the letters. But the most important reason that I prefer to avoid algebra is that I know how the SAT operates. The wrong answers aren't random. They're the answers that we are most likely to get if we make an algebra mistake. They're traps. But if we're doing arithmetic instead, then a lot of those traps don't really work on us. We'll see all of this again and again as we do the other questions in this lesson. The SAT math strategies can make the questions easier. But look, the SAT strategies are not some magical solution that's going to instantaneously improve your scores. You need to make a conscious effort to use them, which takes practice. Plus, they don't always work. There will be times when you have no choice but to solve SAT questions using traditional algebra. But the key takeaway for this lesson is that avoiding algebra is a good general principle, and that the SAT math strategies give us new powerful tools that we can use to solve complex and confusing questions that we might otherwise have gotten wrong. Your instincts to use algebra are going to be very strong. Your math teachers have programmed you like a robot to solve with algebra. I'm asking you to be open-minded. You have to be willing to be reprogrammed. Change your strategy, change your score. So for this next question, try to guess and check with these answer choices. We don't want to solve for k. k cannot be any number in the universe. It can only be 2, 4, 8, or 16. Even if you think you have a hunch for what the answer has to be, I want you to take a minute and check your guess. Pause the video and start it up again when you're ready. When you're coming up with that first guess, it's okay to just start with whatever answer jumps out. A lot of SAT questions are designed to lead us toward a certain answer choice, and it's okay to follow that lead, as long as we actually do the work of checking our guess. In this case, choice A seems like it might be right, since half of 8 is 4, and then splitting it up even further would mean trying 2. Guess and check by replacing the Ks with 2s. We probably knew from the start that this question was testing foiling and factoring, which are related operations, kind of like multiplication and division. But guess and check lets us do this question in reverse. Instead of factoring the first expression, we can foil the second expression. This is definitely an improvement since foiling is easier than factoring, especially when we have that one half in the beginning, which kind of makes me nervous. We can leave it aside for a second and just do the foiling. We get x squared minus 2x plus 2x minus 4. The middle terms cancel out and we are left with x squared minus 4, which you might recognize as difference of two squares or dots factoring. But don't forget about the one half, which now gets distributed to both parts, and that makes the problem obvious. One half of four is two, not eight. We foiled, but we didn't get the expression that we were supposed to. This may seem like we did a lot of work for nothing, but you can't think like that. We may not have gotten the correct answer, but everything we did helped us understand this question better. Our process was correct. Now we just guess a new choice and do the exact same steps. It's robotic, in a good way. I just moved down the line to choice B and notice that my work is identical except for the new numbers. I plugged in for K. And this time when I distribute the one half, I get exactly what I was looking for. That's it. I'm done. No need to check the remaining answers since we've already proven that choice B works. Could you have solved this with traditional algebra? Sure. But most people who get it wrong pick choice A because they fall for the trap that the SAT set with the one half. We take half of 8 and get 4, which we then factor into two twos. We don't notice that this is a trap because it still feels like we're doing advanced math. The SAT uses our confidence against us. Guess and check forces us to prove our confidence with actual numbers. It's safer, especially near the ends of the math sections, where questions are supposed to be hard, but often feel easy. That's a bad sign that we might be falling for a trap. 
better to use the SAT strategies to prove our feelings right. This next question might be the opposite case. It's easy to read, but hard to understand. A lot of people have trouble sorting through the stories that just throw a lot of information at you at once. Guess and Check, once again, lets us reverse the way we think about the question. We can start with the answer choices, which are much easier to understand than the question. I'd guess choice B first, because it's in the middle. And if I'm wrong, I can adjust by moving toward a bigger or smaller number. But guessing choice B gives us a clear starting point. What would it mean if we had four cars that sat seven people each? Try to work backwards from that information and see if you can prove the correct answer. Okay, if we have four cars that seat seven people each, then that's a total of 28 people. There are a few places to go from here, but I tend to focus on small numbers first. I see that there are nine cars total. If four of them are already accounted for, then there must be five remaining that each seat five people. That's another 25 people. But if we add up all the people, we only have 53, which isn't enough. The question tells us that there are supposed to be 55. Our guess was wrong, but we had a much easier time figuring out what to do because we had a number as a starting point. Now we can just apply those same steps to a new number. We should try choice C because we want more cars that seat seven people so that we have more people overall at the end. Again, notice that our steps are exactly the same as what we did before for choice B. We multiply five times seven to get 35. We subtract five from nine to get four cars remaining, which we then multiply by five to get another 20 people. And since 35 plus 20 is 55, we know that choice C is correct. We can be confident in this answer. Could we have solved this with traditional algebra? Again, absolutely. We would need to generate a system of equations, and many of you may have been able to do that very easily. It would look like this. But there are two problems with this algebraic approach. First, if you don't know how to come up with these equations, then you're kind of stuck. Maybe you'd eventually figure them out if you kept rereading the question, but that wastes time. I'm always warning students against their strategy of staring at a question until an idea pops into their heads. It usually doesn't work. Either the idea never appears, or you waste a lot of time waiting for it. Guess and Check gives us a goal right away. We start working on step one immediately. My advice is to stop your habit of staring as quickly as possible. If you catch yourself staring, you need to ask yourself if an SAT strategy can work instead. You want to be moving through the question as soon as possible. And it's okay if you start step one without knowing step five, or even step two. A lot of times, the next step reveals itself once you do the step that comes before. The SAT strategies are a great way to get step one faster and trust that we'll figure the rest out as we go. The other problem with the algebra is that writing equations requires that we know and understand all of the steps right away. Equations have to take all of the information from the question and correctly put it together at once. That's a challenge. And if we make a mistake on one piece of the equation, we might not see it until it's too late. The SAT strategies like Guess and Check let us spread the information out over multiple steps. We take the question one piece at a time. And that means we're more likely to notice a mistake and fix it. And preventing mistakes is a big reason we use the strategies instead of traditional algebra. For this next question, I want you to pause the video and do it the way you would do it in school, which is almost certainly going to involve algebra, but that's okay. Don't check your work either. Just do it the once and then we'll go over it. Okay, hopefully the algebra wasn't too hard, I would consider this to be pretty basic, fundamental algebra that you absolutely need to know for the SAT, regardless of strategies. But I'm going to solve this using the arithmetized strategy, which is probably new to you. It's kind of like guess and check in that we're trying to use numbers and arithmetic to replace letters in algebra. But this time, the answer choices don't give me numbers to guess. I'm going to make up my own numbers to test in the equation. And since I'm lazy, I'm going to pick the laziest number. I'm going to pretend that x is equal to zero. 
what would happen? Well, the original equation would get a lot easier because all of these variables would basically disappear because they'd turn into zeros. In fact, my equation becomes 9 minus 1, which is very obviously 8. Now that's not an answer, but we can arithmetize the answer choices the same way that we arithmetize the question, and we have to be consistent. I made x equal to 0 at the beginning, and x has to stay 0 for the answers. But again, since zero is such a conveniently lazy number, most of this algebra just disappears, and I'm left with only the ending numbers of each choice. Choice D gives me eight, so it has to be right. If these are equivalent expressions, then they should give me equivalent numbers when I substitute the same value for my variable. Hopefully, you got the same answer when you solved with algebra, but if you added wrong or distributed wrong, then you would have gotten one of the wrong answers without really noticing. This is supposed to be an easy question, so you really can't afford to lose these points because of a careless mistake. Arithmetize simplifies the algebra so that we're less likely to make those careless mistakes. In fact, arithmetize can feel like a spell that magically changes algebra into arithmetic, but I promise you that it's not magic. We're using a fundamental principle of algebra to help us, which is that variables stand for numbers. If we see a question where x doesn't stand for a specific number, then we can pretend that it's any number we want. If you don't believe me, try another number in the question and the choices. I promise that you'll still get choice D. Here's another question that could be solved with algebra, but look at those answer choices. They're almost identical except for the pluses and minuses. If I lose one negative while doing algebra, I'm going to get this question wrong, and I don't think it's worth the risk. Try arithmetizing instead. Again, pick the laziest number and make it equal to zero. If x is zero, then the original expression is equal to five. So is choice A. But it's not the only answer that equals five. If we plug zero into all of the answer choices, we notice a problem. Both A and C give us the result that we wanted. It's okay, this happens sometimes when we arithmetize. We occasionally pick a number that works in multiple answer choices. We didn't do anything wrong, it's just bad luck. And we can fix it pretty easily too. All we need to do is pick a new number for x. Let's try one since it's also a pretty lazy number. Our original expression would now be equal to four. And a new number for the question means a new number for the answer choices. But we don't need to retry choices B and D. We've already proven them wrong. Just plug one into choices A and C. This time, only choice C gives us the value that we're looking for. Now there are some tutors who will tell you that you should never pick zero or one because of what just happened. They're terrified that you'll arithmetize with a number that gives you multiple answer choices. I disagree very strongly with that advice. Zero and one aren't numbers that you should avoid. They are the best numbers to pick for the vast majority of questions. Yes, it's true that they sometimes give you multiple possible answers, but who cares? We still eliminate a few wrong answers, and then we can always pick a new number to finish the job. Even if zero and one fail, they fail quickly, so we don't waste a lot of time doing annoying arithmetic. Plus, even the more complicated numbers, like two and three, could give us multiple choices that seem correct. So avoiding one and zero doesn't actually solve the main problem with arithmetizing. The solution is actually just to check every single answer choice every single time you arithmetize. With guess and check, we don't need to check all of the answers because we're getting our numbers from the choices themselves, so we know it's possible that only one is correct. When we arithmetize by making up our own numbers, there's a chance that we get unlucky and pick a number that works for multiple choices. So just be thorough and check every choice every time. In the long run, arithmetizing will save you more time and more points, so it's worth it to be thorough. And as you practice, arithmetizing will feel less tedious and you'll get good at knowing which numbers to pick. For example, three, I would know to arithmetize because this algebra looks absolutely miserable. Four variables, are you kidding me? This is exactly the kind of question where you wanna train yourself to use SAT strategies instead of algebra. And because I'm experienced at arithmetizing, I know to avoid picking zero for y in this case. When I skim the answer choices, I notice that the y term is changing. 
And if I made y equal to zero, then I wouldn't notice that change when I plug zero into the choices. Essentially, I can see that both choice A and choice C would be mathematically the same if y were zero. But if that's confusing, don't worry about it. For now, I would much rather you think about when to arithmetize instead of the specifics of which numbers to pick. Trust me that you'll get better with experience. Try this question on your own and see if arithmetizing makes it easier for you. I ended up picking 1 for x and 2 for y. You may have different numbers, but it shouldn't matter. That's the best thing about arithmetizing. The numbers we pick shouldn't really matter that much, so we can do whatever we think is easiest. The important thing here is that I did not make up random numbers for a or b. Those values are part of the given equations, so I solve for a and b based on the random numbers that I picked for x and y. Since there are so many letters and numbers flying around, we need to make sure that we stay organized so that we don't substitute the wrong number accidentally. Since a is 5 and b is 2, the value of 2a plus 4b would come out to 18. Substituting 1 in for x and 2 in for y in the answer choices, I see that only choice b also gives me 18. And that's it. This would have been one of the hardest questions on a no calculator SAT section, and we just got it right very quickly by doing what? A little addition and multiplication? The actual algebra way to solve this involves substitution and complex factoring. There is no way that that is easier than what we just did. The main problem with arithmetize, or any of the SAT math strategies, is that people just don't remember to use them. Your algebra instincts are so strong that you can't help yourself. Your teachers have programmed you very well. When you see variables and equations, you just start solving before you even consider that there might be another way. Luckily, we can take advantage of some of those robotic tendencies by reprogramming ourselves for the SAT. This final strategy is my favorite because it's very robotic. Plug points into equations. If you have a question that gives you points and equations, plug the points into the equations. This works for so many different topics and it doesn't really require much thought. If you see points, if you see equations, plug the points into the equations. For this question, we get lots of points in the chart and lots of equations in the choices. It looks crazy, like it's gonna be really hard, but it's really not. My advice is to pick the laziest point so that you can do the easiest math, but make sure that you check every single choice. For me, the laziest point was 2 comma 4, mostly because I don't want to work with fractions if I can avoid it. I plug the 2 in for x and simplify it, and hope that I get 4 as the result, or the f of x. Skipping through all the arithmetic, only choice D includes the point 2 comma 4. Another lazy point that a lot of people use is 1 7 halves, which is fine, but you should have discovered that it works for multiple answer choices. So just like arithmetize, we need to check every single choice because we sometimes get unlucky and pick a point that works in multiple equations. We could have solved this algebraically by recognizing that we have a line and then solving for the slope and y-intercept. But why do that to ourselves? It's so much more work for no benefit. This next question also looks very hard, and if we read it, we probably get even more confused. But when I see it, I'm immediately thinking about SAT strategies that might make this easier. And because I see equations in my answer choices, I start looking everywhere for points to plug in. Sometimes it's obvious that we're given both points and equations, but other times we need to remember to look for those things. The equations signal me to look for points, and a graph is really just a collection of points. It's really no different than the chart that we just had. Before you try it on your own, though, I want to make it clear that we need to pick points from the line, not the dots. A scatter plot includes two things. The dots, which represent the actual data points, in this case the actual stars included in this study, and the line, which represents a way of connecting the dots to understand a pattern. The question is specifically asking us for the equation of the line, so we can ignore the dots. Pick points that lie in the line, 
and it doesn't matter if there's a dot nearby. Ignore the dots, and you can use a calculator for this question. I picked the point 3,4.2, mostly because I'd rather not deal with decimals twice if possible. Plugging 3 into M in choice A, I get 4.1625. That's not quite 4.2, but it's pretty close. And this is going to happen when we're estimating our points from a graph. We eyeball it as best we can and get comfortable with a bit of rounding. Now, we can't just pick choice A, but we definitely shouldn't rule it out. Let's see if we find anything closer. Skipping all the arithmetic, we see that choice A is by far the best, and now we are justified in picking it. And that's it, we're done with this question. And notice that we didn't solve this question with some abstract theory or formula, we simply tested the answers that we were given, and only one of them made sense. You need to let go of this misconception that the best solution to every question is whatever your math textbook would tell you to do. This is not a math test. This is an SAT. Your job is not to solve everything in a way that would make your math teacher happy. Your job is to get the points in whatever way works. We just learned three new strategies that work really well on the SAT. They might not work in your math class, but they work on the SAT. Plug points into equations is self-explanatory. If you have points and you have equations, plug the points into the equations. Guess and check probably isn't a new strategy but it is very effective at stripping away the confusion of a question and letting you focus on one piece at a time. It's great for the SAT because most questions limit your possible answers, so we can simply test those possibilities. Arithmetize might seem new, but it works because of the same algebra rules that you learn in school. But unlike S and check, we pick our own numbers to help us understand what's going on inside of an equation. Even though I talked about these three tools as individual strategies, they are very similar to each other. The lines between them are blurry. And that's because they all operate under the same principle. Avoid algebra so that you can do arithmetic. Algebra is confusing. Algebra is prone to mistakes. Arithmetic is intuitive. Arithmetic is easier to organize. Whenever you look at a math question and feel that moment of confusion, of panic, of frustration, of exasperation, that's your brain telling you that maybe you should try one of these new strategies. It might not work. The strategies are not perfect. They don't guarantee right answers. But they are new tools that you need to practice using. And the more that you use them, the more effective they'll become. You'll learn what kinds of questions they work best on, what kinds of numbers to pick. And along the way, I think you'll find that you'll fall for fewer traps and, yes, earn more points. Go try a practice math section, especially the no calculator section. Don't time yourself. Just look for opportunities to use these new strategies. If you need more help with the math sections, I encourage you to purchase a full copy of my SAT Math Packets Study Guide. I review all of the topics that are tested on the exam, and I always emphasize the SAT-specific strategies. My explanations tell you when a strategy is more efficient than doing things the traditional way. And I think that this is a big difference between my study guides and pretty much everything else that's out there. Most SAT math books are merely reteaching you the same material that you learned in school. And if you didn't learn it the first time in school, I very much doubt that a textbook that you read on your own as you cram for an SAT is going to make it click. Change your strategy, change your score. My Math Packets Guide will help you do just that, and I've also written a study guide for the reading and writing sections, which also emphasizes new ways of approaching the questions. Go to sateltutoring.com to purchase my study guides in paperback and ebook formats, and to take advantage of lots of other free SAT prep resources. If you found this lesson helpful, you can do me a favor by please subscribing to my YouTube channel. It really does help me out. I'm Mike Sattel. Thanks for watching. And I hope you learned something.